What's up, friend? Welcome back. Um, thanks so much for sticking with me. Uh, as we go through this process for building out an object-oriented version of chess in Ruby, uh, in the previous episode we went through and added all the game logic for figuring out if we're in check or in checkmate or... Um, and then we also added some logic to duplicate the board because we, all, we had... Um, we wanted to add this tool so that we could duplicate the board, try a move, see if we're in check, and then bail out if we weren't in check. So that, that's what we were working on last time. In this episode, what I wanted to do was go back to our game class and improve our play method so that um, when someone is in check, we tell them that they're in check, and then the game, uh, or, and then if the game is in checkmate, then the game is over. So right now we have a very simple game loop. We just say like, wow, while not over, so while the game is not over, we're gonna uh, we're gonna print out the board. We're gonna say whose turn it is. We're gonna take the turn, and the taking the turn is like receiving in which piece they want to take, pick up, and where they want to place it. And then we swap the player, so we change who the current player is, um, and then we uh, keep going. But there is no there is no like way to figure out who, like is the game over yet. So that's the thing that we want to figure out today is whether or not the game is over. And I think what we wanna do is, um, we have reference to the current player, so in here we could check to see like, um, if the, so we're gonna swap the player down here, and then if the, the current players, this is gonna be a new current player at the end, so at, after this turn happens, so it's like, let's say it's Black's turn, Black, makes a move, then we're gonna swap, and then it's gonna be white's turn, and then white is going to, we're gonna to check to see if white is in checkmate, and if white is in checkmate, then it's gonna be over. So if um, board.checkmate of current player dot color, um, I think, so that's that's just like one way to say that something is over, right? Like um, that the current player is in checkmate. The other way that it could be over is if we're in a stalemate. So I don't actually know how does a stalemate work. You don't have any. Um, let's just say that this is kind of like where we'll draw the line for the functionality of our of our chess game is like, it just goes until someone is in checkmate. And then if you, if you get to a point where there's a stalemate, then you'll just have to know that it's a, st <laughs> that it's a stalemate. Uh, okay, so then that was actually pretty, fairly simple. Um, so let's go back into our main class and let's like move our, so right now we've sort of set up the board so that we can easily put black into checkmate. Um, but let's move it around just a little bit so that um, the rooks are in different positions and then we can kind of just move, we can move the king around and try to get into checkmate. So, um, let's, and let's start up our game here. And uh, again, this is so like such a nice feature of being able to pass in the board into the game is we can sort of like set up the board how we want it before we start the game so that we don't have to play through the entire thing or every single scenario to figure out whether or not we're in check or checkmate at the end. The other thing that I was thinking about doing was in the game, when we when we do play, um, right here what we could do is check to see like, if um, board.in check of the current player.color, then we could, we could say like you're in check basically, like um, uh, puts like um, you are in check or maybe like the, the actual color of the person uh, or the, of the player. So current player.color is in check. So it's gonna say like it's white's turn, white is in check or something like that, right? And then we'll say take turn, swap player. Um, I think that's it. So uh, where do we need to put the pieces? So if we're thinking about the chessboard, if the king is in the corner, let's move the king out of the corner a little bit. Let's put him at 1-1. One, one. And then let's move the rook to like 3-2 and 4-2. So 3-2 and 
2. And then let's run this and see if we can get a game printed out over here. Okay, fantastic. All right, so we've got we've got our two rooks here and we have the king there and it's black's turn. So black is this piece. So if we picked up the black piece, which is at 1, 1, 1, 1, and we tried to move him to um, 0. Let's actually try to move him to the right, and we shouldn't be able to. So we want to go to 1, uh, one 2. I should say, uh, wait, are we allowed? To, oh, we're allowed to do that because these are on 3, right? Oh, wait, no. We should not be able to do that because we're moving into check. Okay, so something is wrong. Something is wrong. We should not have been able to move into check. So when we do the move, so on the board, when we do the move, what are we looking at? So we're moving the piece. So does the available, if the available moves does not include the end position, I wonder if we can use safe moves here now because, um, yeah, so I think we can. Because we're using move bang inside of safe moves, I think we might be able to use safe moves here without getting into an infinite loop. So let's stop and then restart. And we're going to go 1, 1 to 1, 2. So we're going to restart the game. And we're going to say 1, 1 to 1, 2. And that should fail. Right. Great. OK. So we are not allowed to move into check now. OK, so that, that was like a little bug that we had that we fixed there. So we need to select a position that we want to move to, and we can move to all of these. So we are at 1-1. One, one. Why don't we move to 2-0 two, two zero here? So we'll say 2-0. OK. And now it's white's turn. So white is going to move this rook. And let's say we want to move the rook up here. So I think the rook is at 3. Where are we at? <laughs> 3, 2. So we're going to say 3, 2. We want to select 3, 2. And we want to move the rook. Let's move the rook to 2, 2. 2, 2. Okay. Now it is black's turn and black is in check. That's fantastic. Okay. So now we're able to see it down here in the bottom. Uh, we do see that black is in check. Great. So we want to select the black piece, which I think is at 2, 0. We want to move it. Let's move it to 3, 0. And okay, it's the white white piece's turn. So let's move this uh, let's move this rook up one, and then we'll move the king down. Then we'll move this rook way over. Yeah, that should be fine. So we want to go from four three. So four three to oh, so we didn't select a white piece. So it's four two four two, and we want to go to three two, and then we've moved up here. Okay, great. It's the black's turn. Black again is in check because we just moved um, here, so that black is in check. So let's move the black piece down, which I think is at three, zero. We'll move to four, zero. And okay, now it's white's turn. Let's move this piece from um, zero, one, two, from two, 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 zero. I think that's allowed. Great. Okay, so now we're here. Now it's black's turn. Black again is in check. OK, so if we move black to this position down here, which I think so we're at two, three, four, zero should pick up the black piece. And then we want to move to five, one. That should be allowed. OK, and now what we want to do is move the. Yeah, I think we want to move this rook over one this way. So we're at uh, 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 0. We want to move to 2, 1. And then black is in check. OK, great. Black is not able to move. Let's move this piece back over this way, and then we'll put him into checkmate. So then we can go from, um, uh, what is this? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 5, 0. Okay, it's white's or yeah, it's the white piece's turn. Now we're gonna like put him into checkmate. So we're gonna move this rook to here, and then the king won't be able to get out because both both moves will be in checkmate, I think. So we want to move this piece from zero one to three. Uh, is that three two? I think two three zero. 
and that's it. Oh gosh, come on, how how anticlimactic, right? Like the game just ended, but it knows that uh, it knows what checkmate is. So if we go back to the game over here, we probably want to say like uh, print out the board one more time, and then say like who the winner is. So um, puts game over, and then we can say uh, the winner is. And then I think it's like the opposite color. Um, so, uh, yeah. Let's actually just swap. We'll swap the players back again. Uh, so we don't have to like add the logic here for figuring out who the other player was that's, that's, that lost. Okay, so I think that should work great. Um, and yeah, so maybe like for our, for the grand finale here, we can just put the king at, well, no, yeah, I think, I think that's where we'll stop it. It's just like, it's kind of a pain to like move everything around one at a time like that. So um, now we have a working chess game, right? So this, this totally works. Everything about this works uh, well enough that you could actually go and play this with a friend. Um, right now we only have one concept of a player. It's a very simple class that just takes in the color and allows you to um, get the move from standard input with a comma separated list of like coordinates of where you want to pick the piece up and where you want to put it down. Um, but let's go through and make some improvements. So let's do some refactoring now. So in our main class here, we have a bunch of requiring relative stuff and we're kind of like pulling in weird, pulling in the pieces from like different places. We have this pieces, um, we have a pieces.rb file that just pulls in all the pieces, but now we have like quite a few files that we're managing. So the very first thing I want to do in terms of organization is add a new folder called pieces. And now I want to move like the bishop into pieces and the king into pieces, the knight into pieces, the pawn into pieces, and the like queen into pieces, um, the rook into pieces, and steppable and slideable can probably also go into pieces. And let's also move piece into pieces. Um, okay, so now we have we have this pieces dot rb and pieces as a directory. This is actually a common pattern that I've seen a lot, where we have um, we'll have like a Ruby class. And its job is purely to import the, the classes that are in some subdirectory. So here we want to just go in and add like the pieces directory here. So we're going to say pieces slash pieces slash. Um, okay, that cleans it up just a bit. And then we have our board renderer and we have a board class. Um, the board renderer really is actually just printing. This is actually printing out. We're using put statements here. So an alternative that would be a little bit better would be to actually just return the string value and then allow the game to actually render things back. Um, the other thing that I've talked about a lot is the null object pattern. So the null object pattern is, is uh, a tool for avoiding having to pass in, um, to pass around or to, to, to check, to do nil checking everywhere, right? So let's do some refactoring here for the nil, the null object pattern. Instead of using null or nil on our board when we, cr when we construct the board here, right? So we're setting up the board and this is initializing the array with an eight by eight array of nils, right? Um, but instead of nils, what we wanna do is pass in a special class whose responsibility is to represent the absence of something. So here what we might do is add a new file called like the null piece.rb. And this is going to be a class just like every other piece. Class null piece. Uh, except that um, we can do special things on the null piece that represent the absence of a piece. So if we look at night, right? When you look at night, there's a couple methods that are implemented here. Move ders, we've got 2s. It's got, it's including the steppable thing with available moves. But this, this 2s one is interesting because right now, if you call .2s on a nil, you get back the empty string, which um, right now in our board renderer, 
when we're checking to see if the piece is nil, we're printing out an empty string, uh, actually two spaces. So what we want to do, the very first thing we probably want to do is add a 2s here. Um, that will return just a space. Okay, so that will represent like a space on the board that does not have a piece. Um, and then what we can do is go back into our board renderer and instead of checking to see if the piece is nil, we should be able to just remove all of this and it should work just the same. Now, um, the other thing that we need to do is when we actually construct the board, rather than constructing it with nils here, we wanna pass in the null piece, right? We wanna put pass in a null piece. So there is a, um, rather than creating new instances of these nil null pieces or these the null, ob typically with the null object pattern, you will use a singleton object and a singleton will give you an instance. So what is a singleton? I think we can include this. So we want our, our null piece to include the singleton. And the way that this works is instead of calling dot new, so we're not gonna call dot new, we're gonna call dot instance. And dot instance is gonna give us back the one and only instance. It's kind of um, the singleton pattern is sometimes referred to as the Highlander pattern. If you've watched that show from the 90s where like, the guys are fighting with swords um, or, or the people are fighting with swords. It's the, uh, there can only be one, right? Like there's something about like the Highlander where there's only ever one person who's like uh, <laughs> invincible or uh, Im yeah, immortal. And um, the same thing is true with the null piece, right? So we're gonna include singleton here, which means that we want to use the instance of the null piece. There's only gonna be one in memory ever and that'll keep things nice and nice and snappy and convenient and then we can call null piece dot instance here um, and then we should i think maybe okay uninitialized constants so we got to go back to our pieces class and import the null piece um, so we can do that here null piece okay notice the convention also that the name of the file the ruby file is snake case and then it this matches exactly what the class name is but the the class name is like a can't like Pascal case or something. Um, okay, we might need a library for this. Do we need a library for singleton? Singleton, do we have to require? Yeah, we do, require singleton. Okay, I think this is built in, but it's probably just like not part of stuff that you get by, by default. So let's see if we have it in replit. Um, okay, undefined method color for null piece. Great, so now we can just, uh, Wait, where is this being called? Line 56 on board, 56 on board. Do we actually want to check the color? Um, color, hmm, should the piece have a color? So, okay, so instead of, instead of worrying about this logic here, what we wanna do is worry about our pieces logic because pieces right now is rejecting the pieces that are nil. Um, so we actually want to reject the pieces that are dot is a null piece, I think. And I believe that would get rid of that maybe. Piece on line 28. So piece on line 28. Okay. All right. So now we don't have to check if it's nil anymore. Um, and instead of having the color be black or white, we can just go back to our null piece object and make a method def color, and that'll just return nil, which now we're just gonna be comparing nil to black and nil to white. Um, but now we are able to play our game. So this kind of refactoring is a little bit gnarly because we don't have any automated tests. And in fact, it's especially gnarly because this isn't even actually stored in, <laughs> in version control or anything. So um, I've been recording this whole series on Replit, trusting that Replit's just gonna rock it and like be fine, but um, it's been good so far. So let's just keep, keep driving on. So we've got, um, let's try to find any other places where we're checking for nil. Uh, oh, right. So here, instead of putting nil at that position, we wanna put a null piece. So null piece dot instance uh, nil. 
Okay, is it empty? So instead of checking is it nil here, we wanna check is it, um, does it equal null p dot instance? I think that should work the same. And then if king is nil, meaning yeah, we didn't find it, so that one's a good nil. Okay, that's the only nil that's left in board. What about game? Uh, nil, let's see. All right, so here we no longer need this nil check. And re recall that we had a bug where we weren't checking to see if it was nil, and so we had an issue there before. We no longer need that. Nil, start position is nil. That's the only one that's left there. Pieces, player, great. Okay, so we are, we are looking good. So that is the null object pattern. That's a handy pattern that you can use anytime that you want a class to represent the absence of something. Um, okay, I'm trying to recall if there were any other major refactorings that we wanted to do. Let's go through and just take a look at all of our code here and see if there's any ways that we can tighten this up a bit. So um, we have the start chess method here and we're iterating over the board and we're creating all of our pawns. Um, and then here we're saying rook, rook, knight, knight, bishop, bishop, king, queen, king, queen. Um, so I'm trying to think of ways that we might be able to clean this up. Um, one thing that comes to mind is rather than like having all the initialization on one line, I wonder if we can make this simpler by just having a list of classes. So like Rook, um, Knight, uh, Bishop, because we can just pass the class name, right? And now we can work with the classes directly. Um, and that, that's really like one row sort of, of the pieces. And then we can say dot each do class. Um, when you're creating a, lo uh, a variable that refers to a class, like a, in a class, an instance of a class like this, or the class name directly, sometimes we use this K class um, by convention. I actually saw this over here, right, in Singleton. In their example, they called their class class with a K, which is kind of cool. Um, so we're going to iterate over all of these classes, and then I think um, we need to do like uh, zero, zero or seven, or maybe we need this same, this same sort of thing where we get like the row and column. Um, so that should give us like the back, the black row and the white row for each of these classes. And then I think we might be able to do something like class.new or like, let's see board at um, so we need we need to know the the column and the column is going to be defined by the index of the class so we can say each with index this will give us the class and the column and we'll make this row and then we're going to say board at row column is equal to class or maybe we call it like piece class dot new. And then we need to pass in, um, actually, yeah, let's make it location is equal to this thing. Just trying to make it clear. Like, so if anyone came back to this and was trying to read through it, um, they would see that this refactoring really cleaned it up and made it easy to read. And we want to pass in the board and we want to pass in the location and we want to pass in the color. So I think that might actually work instead of all of this stuff. Um, and then if we go back to our main class and we comment out our test board there and we make a new B equals board dot start chess. And then we run it, we should see like a fully set up thing. All right, piece on line 28. Piece on line 28, we got a bug. We have got a bug, piece on line 28. If the board location's color. Okay, so somewhere we're still adding nils to somewhere. We are still adding nils. Pawn in available moves. So pawn, pawn in available moves board.empty hmm so in checkmate in check 
each the block so in check gosh it looks like it looks like we do we're still getting nils that are slipping in here somewhere so oh you know what it is is when we're duplicating the board um we did not update the board duplication logic to work with nil yeah we didn't update this to work with the nil pieces but board.new hmm Board.new should have initialized the array with null piece objects. Hmm. Okay, what, where did this come from? In available moves on pawn. So we're on pawn and we're in available moves and we're on line 29 on line 29 we're checking to see if it's an enemy at the diagonal left is it an enemy at the diagonal left an enemy is a method on piece and here we're checking okay let's just print out um uh, board at location because it should not be nil it should be the null piece instance ah what why do we have an extra one down here that's whack okay Hmm. P oh, you know what? P location. I wonder if we need that null check because it's out of bounds. Five eight is out of bounds. All right, so where we're checking enemy. Um let's say let's just check to make sure that it's on the location or it's like in inbound. So board in bounds location and the color is not the same color. Okay, great. All right, so we were able to print this out and it looks like, yep, our king and our queen are across from each other. So that looks cool. Um, so that was kind of a fun, that's kind of a fun refactoring. Like we got rid of these lines by doing this fancy sort of loop over all of the different classes here. Um, let's see if we can get these all on one line. Um, yeah, that's that's neat. That's neat. Okay, cool. I can't remember where I saw this sort of pattern. Um, all right. Um, what else? What other refactorings could we potentially make to clean this up a bit? So this one, this one is interesting, right? Where the row is less than the grid length and greater than the grid length. I think that there is a method between that we could use to clean this up. So let's see if we go to IRB. Um, is, is, I wonder if, is it, I think it might be on number between uh, zero and five. Is two between zero and five. Cool is two between zero and one. False is two between zero and two. True, okay. So I think we might be able to say something like, row and column dot all are um, um, they're all between the grid dot length and grid dot first dot length okay so this ended up being longer or like less clear maybe than this one so i think i'm just going to keep the second one there all right um, the other thing here, okay, that's good, that's good. Uh, empty, okay, we've got our instance, fantastic. Mm-hmm, okay. All right, we're moving our piece. I'm gonna remove some of these comments from the bottom just to clean things up. Our pieces are organized into a pieces directory. We have this pieces, this top level pieces thing. We covered a ton of uh, a ton of concepts here. So in the board class, I'm just gonna like do a quick recap of everything we talked about. We talked about the factory method pattern. We talked about these macros and what adder reader, writer, assessor do. Um, we talked about how to plan out your object oriented code. If you're using like the noun is the classes and the verbs are the methods, that's like one approach. We also talked about the messages that you're sending between things being the methods and then the actors in the systems being sort of secondary to those messages. Uh, we talked about operator overloading. We talked about 
the null object pattern. We talked about the singleton pattern, which is a design pattern here where we have uh, this null piece instance. Um, we talked about initializing instances of nested arrays with, uh, with a specific number of elements. Um, we talked about using question marks in methods as a convention for returning a Boolean value. Um, we did uh, dig in quite a bit here to, uh, we talked about, yeah, the flatten method for flattening out nested arrays into a single, a single flat array. Um, we talked about creating your own error instance or like your own error classes so that you can handle those. Um, we also went into uh, we went into the, t the concept of duplicating or deep duplication of objects so that we could create a new board and temporarily like attempt to make a move to see if we ended up in check. Um, that was kind of fun. What else do we got here? We talked about um, dependency injection with our game right at the very top rather than using the board class directly in our initialize method. Uh, we're taking in the board, the players, and the renderer. So, and this is actually passing in the class for the renderer, which we're using to initialize a new instance of the renderer so we can print stuff out. Um, we talked about keeping your instance variables in the initialize method, like the actual at sign versions of those, and instead using the adder, reader, writer, assessors, so that we can use bare words, and it makes it easier to refactor in the future if we wanted to extract these into more... Um, uh, sophisticated methods. Uh, we looked at this swap player method where we're doing a ternary operation to check like who the current player is and then returning either one or the other. Um, what else did we do? Uh, we, yeah, we got, we got some user input and we were doing a little bit of validation. We printed out some things. Um, let's see, within our player class, this is where we were doing a get s or get the string from the terminal. Um, we talked about modules. So with, uh, with our pieces like queen, which is slidable, we talked about including the slidable module, which again is similar to a class, but you can't actually initialize an instance of this. But we did want a method that was shared across several, um, several classes. And so we defined it inside of a module here that we called available moves. And then uh, what we did on the slidable one is we like, sort of uh, iterated and grew the possible moves or the available moves in a certain direction until we either um, ran off the board or ran into an enemy or whatever. Um, what else did we dig into here? Oh, we used a, we, uh, we used a ternary here also for um, rendering out symbols. We also talked about the symbol versus the string and why we would use a symbol. And that's because we don't want to reallocate instances of new strings every time we go. Technically, you can use like the dot freeze. So we could do like uh, black here uh, dot freeze or something that that would uh, achieve the same thing. But I like using symbols. So that's what we ended up doing there. Um, what else did we dig into? Uh, gosh, there's just so much to this. The pawn was actually surprisingly complex, right? We uh, we figured out our available moves. But uh, those were sort of dependent on whether it's at the start and the direction of the pawn. And then we can, you know, you can move one forward or you can move two forward if there's nothing in front of you. Um, and then we also talked about like building up the moves for uh, if, you, if there's an enemy. This method here is particularly long. I would probably go back and refactor this to break this out into like, give, give me just the forward moves and then combine those with like the diagonal moves or something. Um, and then we, yeah, we just selected the ones that were inbound there. Uh, we talked about, yeah, we talked a little bit about inheritance. So we have this parent class piece that all of our uh, our, our specific concrete classes inherit from. Um, and yeah, I think, I think I'm going to wrap it there. We've got a working chess game and I'm really happy. Hopefully you learned a ton. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're still just learning Ruby and uh, you found this useful, I'd really appreciate a like. Maybe even a, a subscribe, if you will. <laughs> uh, and I do, I do like to publish videos about web development with Ruby and Ruby on Rails. So if this was something that you found useful, um, do consider subscribing. I, I plan to put out more content uh, around web development, and I do especially love Ruby. So um, I think that's where I'll call it. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this whole thing. Uh, really appreciate your time and attention. Until next time, I'll see you later. Mm -hmm.